You're listening to podcasts from the Congressional Internet Caucus Advisory Committee, www.netcaucus.org. Is Leonard Bailey. He's the special counsel for national security in the computer crime and intellectual property section for the U.S. Department of Justice. To get the process by which white hat hackers happens in a context in which white hat hackers are looking for vulnerabilities in information security systems and they play an increasingly important role in our nation's cybersecurity. And yet the laws and guidelines that ultimately control the research they do are vague and outdated. So we're here today to discuss the policy that is being implemented today, some of the leading best practices vulnerability disclosures. Get us started cover one of the basics, which is why is vulnerability disclosure important and exactly what is it? How is it implemented? Um, I think I'll start off with Katie on that. Thanks. So uh, one of the reasons why vulnerability disclosure is important is, you know, all systems are made by humans so far. We have not perfected the AI. We are going to make mistakes. Even with secure development practices, we are going to miss bugs. Um, and those pose threats when they are undiscovered and undiscovered. Employed this software and technology who might need to fix them. So vulnerability disclosure itself is the process of reporting a vulnerability to an organization um, from the outside, whether that is a security researcher, White House, as a customer or someone in your supply chain. So the act of vulnerability disclosure can take place with or without a, a friendly hacker involved. Um, and the reason it's so important is to make sure that if that vulnerability isn't addressed firsthand. Leonard, why from the Justice Department's side is, is vulnerability disclosure important and what has the department done to encourage vulnerability disclosure in a responsible and practical manner. Yeah, thanks, Chris, and thank you for the invitation to speak on the panel. Uh, I'm guessing if you were playing one of these things that's not like the other, uh, the Department of Justice probably would, would leap out on, on this particular panel. Explaining why it is we care about this issue and, and a plucky group of, of researchers came into our office at the computer crime section in the criminal division and said, your ways are strange to us and kind of scary and we think you're chilling legitimate research. And our view of that was that cybersecurity is a very complicated distributed problem. We can't afford to take people off to, um, to, to, to change that. Um, so uh, about three years of engagement later, uh, we have moved forward. We've, I think, had a very healthy exchange that I to Black Hat, about 25 researchers, about what they thought of the department's practice. Engagements, including having a panel of computer security researchers, white hat hackers, down to our annual uh, convention where we have our computer crime prosecutors come together and be trained. Um, and KD was actually on that uh, panel to explain why research matters and what it is they do. Uh, that has been very recently, at the end of July, with a disclosure framework, uh, which is our attempt to assist you know, organizations, large and small, to promulgate policies that are consistent and avoid CFAA concerns, Computer Fraud and Abuse Act, the kind of federal hacking statute concerns that, that you know, possibly could, could pop up. Um, so uh, that's at a high level. I think we'll get further into what the vulnerability disclosure framework says and, and what we're doing with that, but that's sort of the high level what we're doing. Previously, vulnerability research are objectively outdated. Um, maybe, Leonard, you can speak about what are the laws that are currently looking at forward. Sure. So and one of the things that, that we first and foremost at our meeting three years ago was a concern that there was a war on computer security researchers. And uh, we, we, we looked at that. 
and you know we looked at that by looking at the cases that have been brought over the last several years, and we found actually what the Center on Democracy and Technology found in the report that they issued in March of this year, that prosecutions of researchers have been, in their words, extremely rare. Um, the actual finding was there was one case that they were that they cited in the last decade. Um, and so our view is we're not focusing at all on, on, on computer security research as a, as a target for our prosecutions. All that said, uh, we, we hear that there are concerns about how the CFAA might apply to people who are doing computer security research. Um, you know, part of addressing that, we think, is discussions about statutes and perhaps changes that could be made there. There was a proposal made in January of 2015 that we thought went um, a good way towards helping with that by kind of necking down what the 1030A2, 18 U.S.C. 1030A2, which is the um, accessing a computer without authorization or excessive authorization and obtaining information, um, by, by bringing uh, uh, some more, I think, uh, say fidelity to the, the types of information that would have to be taken in order for that to be actionable. Um, but we're also attempting to do this outreach to make researchers more aware of where issues can pop up so that you know, as a matter of kind of policy and practice, they have a better idea of what, what's the sort of conduct that's likely to end up you know, heading towards trouble and prophylactically what can they do instead to act as researchers, demonstrate they're acting as researchers and therefore allow us not to focus on them um, as potentially a criminal. So that brings up important point, which is the way in which security researchers ultimately do this vulnerability research. Um, there's different mechanisms that can be done, that software can be tested within their own computer, uh, isolated typically. There's also the practice, which is I think what, what Leonard's getting to, that's, that's less encouraged, which is testing the security of products that do not belong to the security researchers that are active on perhaps a business or an agency's network. Um, can we talk a little bit about you know what are the best practices when you're when you're doing this research, as well as um, where are those clear boundaries? And anyone in the panel can really weigh in on this. I want to take a step back um, and on to something that Leonard had said. So uh, most of what Leonard was talking about there. So first of all, I think that Leonard and DOJ have done an excellent job in, in doing outreach to security researchers. And uh, I mean, it's from, from my perspective at Rapid7, we, we work with independent researchers, we have our own internal researchers, it's extremely appreciated. You know, there's still a lot of work to be done, but I think that uh, Leonard and DOJ have, have really done an excellent job. And it's very telling about where the policy landscape has moved in the past five years or so when, when it comes to white hat hackers. Uh, I think Congress now recognizes the scope of the cybersecurity problem and realizes that we need all hands on deck, so to speak. Um, there, from Congress's perspective, you know, and so uh, I, I, there are at least a couple of things that uh, to, to pay attention to. So one, Leonard was talking about CFAA mostly, and so the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act. Uh, that is not the only law that impacts the work of security researchers. Um, it may be the most complicated law to actually make any sort of amendment to uh, without having some sort of unintended negative effect on cybersecurity. Um, and uh, the, the hardest problem to solve, I think, is uh, how researchers can deal with publicly available data for which there are terms and services and perhaps even specific outreach from companies asking people not to use the publicly available data in a particular way and whether, they, you know, whether there's that company can put a, forth a technical block that is easily circumventable. Like there's, there's several scenarios like that where it, it becomes a very thorny problem. How do you fix that in legislation without uh, having, uh, giving a free rein to a lot of malicious actors? Um, other laws though, that are, I think, a lot easier to fix that arguably have a greater impact on the liability of security research. And I don't know how familiar you are with that, but that Section 1201 bans circumventing a technological protection measure on a copyrighted work. Software is a copyrighted work. Uh, technological protection measures can include things like encryption, login requirements, region coding. It's, it's actually quite broad. And there is an exception in statute for security testing, but you still have to get the authorization of the copyright owner. 
which makes independent software testing for vulnerabilities actually quite difficult, complying with the letter of the law. Now, like Leonard said, there, anecdotally at least, we don't see a ton of prosecutions for researchers. And those that are, there's often some sort of, uh, you know, uh, re there's a very good reason for it. Um, but private threats, at least anecdotally, uh, those are something that researchers face uh, quite a lot more. And uh, we ourselves, uh, at, uh, I work for a cybersecurity company, we have seen some of these threats and some of them are completely bogus. Um, but we have resources. We're a, we're a thousand person strong company. We can uh, evaluate them from a legal perspective. Independent researchers, not necessarily. They don't necessarily have legal expertise or legal researchers. Um, you know, so there is a chilling effect that we see. For DMCA, what we're talking about largely are devices that the researcher themselves own. They're not necessarily reaching out to somebody else's computer or even publicly available data in order to conduct their research. Um, but that still is in there. Uh, there are different happenings afoot in Congress as well as the Copyright Office to make some changes to actually enable cybersecurity testing, which is not an infringement on copyright. But I would impress upon you, I think CFAA draws a lot of, uh, a lot of the attention in these types of conversations, and there is low-hanging fruit that arguably has a greater impact on researchers in the DMCA. The other thing that I want to emphasize is uh, talking about vulnerability disclosure before getting into the, the laws that are implicated by uh, security research. Um, but for vulnerability disclosure, like Katie mentioned, having a, a company that has a process for receiving intake from external sources uh, uh, on vulnerabilities. There are different ways to do that. Uh, some of them are not appropriate for every company, and I know that uh, the panel can talk at length about that. Um, Congress is taking up this issue in different legislation, and they don't always get it right. So um, I, I know I've been talking for a bit, so I'll, I'll you know, wait for a, a more appropriate time to go into what the different types of vulnerabil vulnerability disclosure is. But for legislative staffers, I think it's important to be familiar with those different levels um, because that will make a big impact on the effectiveness of the program. Frank, you had something to add? Yes, <clears throat> um, and, and thank you, Tim, for, for having me on this panel. Uh, um, I wanted to sort of uh, comment on, on something that uh, uh, Harley uh, just mentioned about uh, the DMCA. So the DMCA, <coughs> uh, under the DMCA, the Copyright Office, the Librarian of Congress, uh, every three years has to sort of review existing exemptions uh, and can grant new ones or re, you know, fashion them. Um, and last year they did uh, provide a, a security exemption. Um, and I'm not going to read all of it, but I would generally sort of make the comment that I think it's pretty well tailored. Um, one key issue from, I think from Oracle's perspective, and I think it's an issue that a lot of vendors uh, of IT are sensitive to, is so there are, there are sort of, you know, issues that have to do with what the researcher is doing when he, is, he or she is um, trying to hack into a software to find vulnerabilities, okay? But then there's, okay, what do you do with the information that you have, that you have gleaned? The, you know, I found this vulnerability. Okay, well, what do you do then? As a researcher, uh, sorry, as a vendor, we feel extremely strongly that if there is a security purpose to your research, that security purpose re needs to lead you to provide that information to the vendor so that the vendor can patch. If you don't do that, if you publicize that uh, information either immediately or before the vendor has been able to patch, then we feel that in almost all cases, it undermines the security uh, purpose of your research and you have then weakened rather than strengthened security. The reason is that in almost all cases, the only entity that can patch that software where you found a vulnerability, the only entity that can do that is the vendor. It is almost never the case that someone else um, can use that vulnerability information uh, to defend themselves. Um, I mean, it's not always the case, but it is really, the, the, uh, at least as far as Oracle is concerned, and, and all of my counterparts at, at, at other sort of You know, that's a really key issue, and that's an issue that, that, is, that I think the Copyright Office has found a really good balance on, um, because they talk about the irresponsible disclosures, uh, they would call the research to fall outside of the exemption, um, they talk about other things in, in their exemption. So, but I feel like 
uh, the, the problem um, that, that Harley was talking about uh, under the context, in the context of DMCA has largely been addressed in a manner that sort of protects sort of equities on both sides, if I may say. Um, just real quick, so the, the Copyright Office's temporary exemption doesn't say anything about disclosure. It says that the research must be performed in a, a safe and responsible manner, but it doesn't mention anything about disclosure. Well, but I mean, in, in its in its sort of the the the, rec the language that went with the, the exemption, the recommendation says refers to quote unquote irresponsible disclosure, which would cause the research to fall outside of the exemption. And irresponsible disclosure, give, I mean, it's not it's not an explicit, but I mean, we've you know the the notion of responsible disclosure is well sort of understood. Uh, um, in the community, and so by contrast, I think irresponsible disclosure is also fairly well understood. But I, I wouldn't mind if, if they went out ahead and said, okay, well, by irresponsible disclosure, we mean when you don't tell the vendor first, you know, you, you go public before the vendor is patched. I'd, I'd be fine with that. Katie, you had something to add? Yes, so, um, so a few different pieces of context here. Um, one, I, I'm one of the co-authors and co-editors of the ISO standard on vulnerability disclosure, which originally started its name as responsible disclosure. One of the first things that, that uh, we did was actually take the word responsible out of the ISO standard, because I cannot imagine trying to standardize on a word that has a moral judgment attached to it. So at the ISO level, at the international standards level, we removed that term. Um, we replaced it uh, there and also at Microsoft, where I was a security strategist, with the word coordinated vulnerability disclosure. And the reason why is that's a, that's a technical description of the desired activity. Whether or not the finder and the vendor can agree on disclosure timing, you want to coordinate even when you disagree. So I created Microsoft's uh, vulnerability disclosure policies. Um, internal HR policies by which the Microsoft employees should conduct themselves when they are disclosing a vulnerability in someone else's product. And I can tell you, um, there were defined roles in the coordinated vulnerability disclosure policy that I wrote for Microsoft because Microsoft certainly would act in the role of vendor receiving bug reports on its own software and services. But because of a program I started called Microsoft Vulnerability Research, where we would look for vulnerabilities in third-party software that affected our customers, much like Google Project Zero does today, um, Microsoft Vulnerability Research ended up with Microsoft acting in the two other major roles in disclosure, that of finder and that of coordinator. So for example, if there was a technology that affected more than just Microsoft, um, you know, a library issue, Dan Kaminsky's DNS bug from 2008 was the initial genesis of requiring this sort of coordination body within the vendor to basically disseminate that information to more than one vendor at the same time. The Heartbleed bug is an example of multi-party vulnerability disclosure in which you need a coordinating you know, kind of effort. But the point I'm making here about these different roles is that that policy, Microsoft's coordinated vulnerability disclosure policy that I wrote, defined the cases in which we as the finder would have to disclose vulnerability information before that third party vendor had a patch. And we had defined the criteria by which we would do so. And that was based on evidence of exploitation in the wild. And the reason for that is if we knew about a vulnerability and we started seeing it getting exploited in the wild and we could actually get that corroborated from some of our antivirus and, and um, IDS partners, protection provider partners, saying we are also seeing this thing being exploited, it would be more damaging to internet security to withhold that information from the public. So it was clearly defined, and there were cases where we would have to do that in the interest of safety. So imagine if it was that difficult for Microsoft to kind of come up with this cohesive policy as Microsoft, Imagine how difficult it would be for an independent or less resourced security researcher to try and make that call about how many people might be in danger um, if I stay silent about a vulnerability I know about and the vendor hasn't patched it yet. So there's this balancing act and that was the attempt by the biggest software company in the world to basically define what those out desired outcomes are and the criteria context to this. Earlier this year, it's not just, as, as Katie mentioned, uh, independent researchers. Earlier this year, there was a vendor, I won't shame by name, but 
talking to Microsoft about research they'd conducted on a vulnerability, and another a blog post about this vulnerability before the event, before Microsoft had the ability to patch the flaw. What happened was hackers exploited the flaw almost immediately after the blog post went up for about 10 days before the vendor could ultimately patch. That is not a situation you would like to have, but independent security researchers, obviously, the large vendor is the first. So I will say something that um, Microsoft made an attempt to actually qualify in its bulletins um, the likelihood occurring within the first two weeks of a patch release, a patch release. You know, the, the reason for that is that using the patch is enough information for security to reverse engineer what changed and figure out what the vulnerability was. So we call it Patch Tuesday, Exploit Wednesday. It quickly became Patch Tuesday morning, Exploit Wednesday after, Exploit Tuesday after, right? So the um, you know, researchers were able to reverse these things. So talk about a disclosure before a vendor has patched leading direct exploitation to take into disclosure, including that of a patch to exploitation. So let's make sure that we understand that this is a black and white issue. Patch means zero exploitation, and plenty of the recent worms can show us that if the patch hasn't been the patch can be available to the vendor. If it has deployed to affected systems, serious vulnerability on your hands. Absolutely agree. That's that's very very true. Uh, it always takes our customers, the, the users, a certain time to implement the patches. Not because they're available on a Tuesday morning, mm -hmm. but they're implemented, you know, Tuesday noon. Uh, the product, the more mission critical it is, mm -hmm. and how many of you are familiar with it? I'm not going to unless I describe Oracle in detail. We're an enterprise software company, so the reason may not know is because we're not on your phone, on your computer. We sell big software that companies use and organizations like government agencies use to run corporate processes, you know, HR and supply chain and accounting. So, you know, accounting. Well, we turn that off until we, why all the patch? Well, you can't turn off accounting. I mean, like, you know, the money flows in the company all the time, right? So, so for mission critical technology like that, implementing patch, installing them is very, it's very difficult and it takes a while. Why it takes us to make sure that patch we're putting in actually. Another comment that I wanted to make is, I think it's everything that, 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 um, that Katie said about you know, the different iterations that you take into account when and how and to whom and uh, you know, communicate information. All of that points essentially a lot of gray, right, to a lot of judgment calls that have to be made by people with a certain expertise. I think that's the core of the problem for a lot of research is they're saying, well, there's, um, there's the law is unclear and that it was and take exception with that. I mean, the problem is that yes, you're going to have precise judgment, and so will prosecutors. But you're not going to have a bright line. I mean, there are certain things that probably can be clarified that are not envisaged at the time the law was enacted. So DOJ issues guidance, uh, uh, the Copyright Office issues exceptions, uh, exemptions, but there is going to continue to be a areas. It will be either too much on one side, allow hacking, but lose hack right, or it will be too much to the other side, and it will allow responsible vendor to say, hey, yeah, you told me vulnerability, I ain't going to do anything about it, and no one can make me, and if you say anything, jail. Situations can So I think we are right, and it's great that's sort of uncomfortable for vendors. It's great that's uncomfortable for researchers. I'm not quite sure that, that we're going to be able to Interesting legislation. You know this line drawing exercise, trying to figure out where you have to set right incentives 
those be those who vote or encourage act. Um, of the, the challenges, I think, with something like the CFAA, which is referred to by many as a vague law, um, is it, it really isn't vague for the purposes that prosecutors use it for. I mean, look at, for example, our website, and we look at the prop. I would say in hundred in the last six um, annually, um, like irrefutably, the people. carders who are stealing data from people. Um, the difficulty in this particular space is this particular practice is on the fringes of the statute. Right? It was not drafted with people who were searching for vulnerabilities for, for good in mind. Um, and so you know, the question that we faced is how do you manage that issue? Uh, I, we like to make sure that we can try to do this with policies and through education. Um, and the debate is you know, how far you have to go in into legislation to, to do this. And I think that that will be a debate that we continue to have. One thing I find interesting is in discussion and being educated by a lot of researchers, I'm often asked, well, why can't you draft a statute that just captures that which is, which is bad? And I mean, my, my response, which and it's not intended to be glib, is I think it's akin to why you can't write code that is perfect, right? That the reason why code sometimes is not perfect is people use it in ways you do not expect, in ways that are not intended to do things that you, you know, do not want. Um, that is sometimes the case for legislation as well. There are various pressure valves for that. Uh, historically, prosecutorial discretion has been one of those pressure valves. We think we've used it responsibly. Um, uh, and, and so that's, I mean, that's why I find this actually a very challenging, interesting policy uh, discussion that requires outreach and understanding among the parties who are implicated by the statute. Chris, can I follow up on uh, Absolutely. something that, uh, well, on, the, on, on this discussion? So I think uh, everything that Frank and Katie said about the dynamics of disclosure is true, um, and that that uh, makes for some considerations for legislating. So for like, like Frank said, it's, it's true that if you disclose a vulnerability before people have the opportunity to patch it, then there is the risk that malicious actors will use it in nefarious ways. Um, but on the flip side also, there may be uh, reasons for safety or from vendor inattention that the researcher then, after a certain time, may disclose to the public. And uh, our own process at Rapid7 for our research is to just talk to the vendor first, we then notify CERT, we wait 45 to 60 days, we work with the vendor, uh, and you know, hopefully on coming up with a patch, but at some point, if we think that the, that the vendor is, uh, either we're not able to reach them, or if the vendor is completely sitting on it, then we do leave ourselves the option for public disclosure, if we think it's the responsible thing to do, if we don't think that it's gonna cause more damage than good. And for some of the bills that I've seen out there that talk about uh, vulnerability disclosure, they, seem to put the uh, public disclosure piece of that process completely in the hands of the vendor. And this runs into the danger that Katie raised, right? That sometimes there may be good reasons to, to, to bring it to the public first. Um, so I, I think if there is a best practice, I think that's, you know, the, the process that we just outlined is, is pretty close to it. Vulnerability disclosure, a the legislation to leave that safety hatch, not to completely forego the possibility of public disclosure in every circumstance. There will be some circumstances where it probably is inappropriate, like a very severe breach, for example, um, but, uh, but to put it completely in the hands of the vendor does run into problems where ultimately there will not be a patch in some cases. So I'd like to touch on, on this broader topic, which is we've spoken a good bit about why security researchers should tell the vendor first what, uh, about a vulnerability, but ultimately, what are the types of incentives or reasons for why a security researcher or whatever, they, if they call themselves a hacker, fi they find a vulnerability but then decide not to disclose it, or um, as Harley mentioned, maybe they decide to just go public with it. Katie? Yes, thank you. Um, so. I, I conducted a completely informal, non-scientific over the last week. I asked 
how old were you when you first started hacking? So the answer for me was under 10 years old. The, the groupings that they give you in Twitter is, you know, they only give you four choices. So I said under 14, because in the United States, under 14 is considered a, a minor for, for, you know, child labor and all that stuff. A 14 to 18 year old bucket, an 18 to 25 year old bucket, and then a 25 year old bucket. So what I was uh, trying to establish is that most hackers start hacking when they're under 18. From this non-scientific poll of Twitter, this was 66% uh, fell into the under 18 bucket, 37% of which were in the under 14 bucket. So when we think about this from a legislative point of view, think about who are the most likely citizens um, who are going to be uh, running afoul of legislation that's quite difficult to understand even for adult professionals um, when it comes to uh, how they should, should behave. Um, and uh, I think in terms of the, what, the question that you asked of what makes a researcher make a decision. Now we've heard a lot of colored hats, white hat, black hat, kind of like, you know, good guys and bad guys, clear cut. I have never actually understood any other profession that denotes people as pure good or pure evil. What I like to, to give the analogy is every single vulnerability you find is like yourself at a yellow light. Everyone has made a risk choice at a yellow light. Do you stop? Do you go through it? How fast are you going at the time? Are there any cops around? You know, are there other cars around? You make all these decisions kind of you know, based on that particular occasion. So every bug represents a yellow light to a researcher. And the incentives that I've been working on trying to, to encourage in vendors is making it really easy for that researcher to not break the law and not keep that vulnerability to themselves because public disclosure, while that you know, can lead to some attacks, it also leads to, to people applying fixes as well. Non-disclosure is actually quite a dangerous state. If a researcher can find a bug and they have no incentive and no safe, you know, safe harbor to feel like they can come forward and report it, it stays unreported until either somebody else finds it and, and reports it, or an attack occurs. And so non-disclosure is something that you don't want that yellow light decision to be, I'm just not gonna drive anymore, you know? Um, there's also a very clear, uh, there's a very clear area where you can accidentally find a vulnerability um, uh, and, and decide because it looks like there's no clear way to report it and you're afraid, you know, that you've, you've essentially accidentally uh, run into this vulnerability without authorization ahead of time, that you just decide not to report it. One example from my own life was back in 2004, wanting to donate to Hurricane Katrina through the American Red Cross website. I lived on O'Farrell Street with an apostrophe in the name. An apostrophe in a website that isn't properly secured and hasn't secured its database can lead to a verbose error coming back I didn't mean to have that uh, error come back, but what it told me as a security researcher was that the database itself could be compromised by an attacker and all the credit card numbers who were donating to Hurricane Katrina were potentially retrievable through this error. That was what I call a hacksident. Hacksidents happen. But I clearly wasn't authorized to perform that testing and I wasn't testing it. I was simply typing in my street name to try and donate to Hurricane Katrina. What did I do with that vulnerability? There was no clear way to report it, and I kept it to myself. And this happens over and over again. And that was something that clearly anyone with an apostrophe in their name could have found. So this is the thing, when we talk about what do we want to encourage, we want to encourage this population of young people who are under 14 years old in the majority, under 18 years old in the broad majority, to approach ev every yellow light bug with a clear path to doing something um, good with it, to reporting it, and getting it fixed. Those are great points, Katie. Um, I think also one of the things here, you know, broadly speaking with these vulnerabilities, is often they can be very valuable, purely from a monetary sense. There are individuals, researchers, who find vulnerabilities, can hoard them, and then can sell them to any number of nation states, intelligence agencies, contractors, um, there's a value in this information and in this skill. And that is also one side that is pushing against white hats, white hats. And um, Frank, do you, do you have anything to weigh in on this? 
people didn't like you know go around selling exploits of our products, right? I mean, it's not good for our users. It's just not good for security. Um, it, it is a very sort of tricky. There's no simple answer to to this problem. Um, I mean, it's part of you know an issue of criminal law that countries should you know uh, crack down on on cyber crime so that the demand for those exploits. Uh, that there are fewer customers, you know, who are willing to buy those exploits. It's also an issue for, for governments to uh, be very uh, restrained in how they participate in uh, that market uh, as buyers um, of exploits. But obviously there we're touching on issues of national security uh, and law enforcement investigations that are extremely sensitive and cannot be reduced to a, oh, it's bad, you shouldn't do it. Um, um, uh, and, uh, and, and for absolutely for, for vendors, uh, I absolutely take the point that vendors, you know, let me, so let me go back a little bit in history, you know, um, it must have been, I don't know, like 20 years ago that before the world of security research and of, you know, coordinated or, or responsible or whatever disclosure, uh, really sort of started sort of appearing that you know, when vendors you know, that shall remain nameless uh, were contacted by people saying, hey, I found a vulnerability in your product, they would either not get a response from the vendor, would get a cease and desist letter or, uh, you know, from a lawyer, something like that. And that was pretty much it. And then over time, you know, because those, it would, would piss off, rightly so, the, the, the researchers, you know, there would be sort of exposure of the vulnerability, et cetera. Over time, you know, vendors, uh, I'd like to say not too slowly, the vendors sort of realized that no, they needed to clean up their act. They needed to have an open ear, you know, provide, you go to the oracle.com website, um, you'll find, you know, a link to, this is how you report vulnerabilities to us. There's, a, there's an email address, et cetera. When we get those notices, we respond, et cetera. Um, so there's a procedure. Um, and yes, vendors have to, I mean, um, within, you know, inter internally, you know, there will be sort of people, uh, you know, programmers, vendors who go like, those people who like send us those vulnerabilities, they're just hackers, are like, well, they found a, a vulnerability in your product, so you better do something about it, you know? You can't just say, ah, oh, they're, they're bad guys. They're not bad guys. If they were bad guys, they would exploit it themselves. So we've gone, as IT vendors, I mean, Oracle was never in the business of, you know, selling, you know, fruit before they, they came in, they stumbled into IT. We've always been an IT company. Uh, we've had, you know, we had our own learning curve. I'd like to think that, you know, we've, we've done pretty well by now. What you're having, what we're seeing now is there are new companies that are emerging in the IT space because they were not, in fact, IT companies originally. They were making, let's say, baby monitors. Um, and all of a sudden they realized, that, hey, you could connect them to the internet because parents like to check on their kids from a distance. So. They, they, for the first time, they, have, they actually write code that goes into their, their baby monitor. They've never done that before, which means that software developers were, didn't exist in their company. Now they're hiring them. It's a new class of employees that are not empowered. They don't have access to, lead, to executive leadership in the company. So they may not you know, like have a lot of power inside the company. That's one phenomenon. And two, they're con connecting those, those products to the internet. They were never connected before. So you're, you're talking about companies that have never even thought about the issue of, oh, when you connect to the internet, what kind of risk profile does it create? How do you mitigate that, et cetera? That's kind of a revolution. Those companies are also going through their own sort of cultural revolution that we went through, I don't know, 15, 20 years ago. Just to give one the number of companies in the Forbes Global 2000, so these are companies that are very well established companies. They make a lot of money and they spend a lot of money on security. The Forbes Global 2000, 96% of them did not have a published way to report a vulnerability to them. So while the Oracles and the Microsofts of the world absolutely have had to develop this capability over the last 15, 20 years, there is a long tail of well-resourced organizations that are not newcomers to the industry, that are not small players, that have absolutely no published means to receive a vulnerability report. And it contributes to the overall frustration of the researcher world. Think about it, if you're trying to do someone a favor and you literally can't even find someone to listen to you, um, this is a huge problem.
this is a kind of a pivotal time. Um, I mean, we come to this er issue with, with humility. We are not the people who are going to tell you how to draft a vulnerability disclosure policy because that's not, that's not in our wheelhouse per se. But what we have seen from the is when you have you know, Microsoft, Google, Twitter, when you have Facebook saying they've spent $5 million on bounties over the last five years, you, you have the market saying that this is something that they care about and think is valuable. And so we're looking for of 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 moving that along. I mean, I, I'm not. I'm just last week we had the deputy attorney general number two at, at Justice um, at the Cambridge Cybersecurity Summit say that companies should look at promulgating a vulnerable disclosure policy, which is you know not where I think people would have thought the department would be nearly three years ago. Um, I, I do want to just take one moment to loop back to one thing, which is, I mean, one of the reasons we created a, a cybersecurity unit in 2014 was we wanted to take the expertise in the we had in prosecuting cybercrime cases and apply it to the prevention side to see, you know, how we might help companies prevent uh, incidents on their network. Um, other than the areas we've worked in before, one new area that we're looking at is this issue of very young people who are learning the trade. Um, and how they're learning the trade and how we can better message to them what is responsible and potentially irresponsible and dangerous um, behavior on, on the internet. Um, and not as victims, actually, in this case, but actually as people can do some harm. I, as someone who has a 15-year-old who is now learning Java you know, in school and is expected to do that, uh, it, it, it's striking many of us that we are requiring the intersection between young people and technology without providing many guidance on what are the rules for that. And this area will continue to grow for all the reasons just stated. I mean, it's an industry standard that there are about 50 errors per 1,000 lines of code. Um, not all those turn into exploitable you know, uh, vulnerabilities, but it's some mark that we will continue to have this challenge of how we deal with vulnerabilities and exploits, and we have a continuing wave of, of people who will be players in this area who right now don't have, and it's unclear exactly how they're learning, how they manage these issues. Harley, I'd like to get you involved in this next one. In terms of- Sorry, can I respond to the previous yes, question please. in the discussion? That I keep doing that. Um, well, no, so um, I think that this is a good time to make a crucial distinction between uh, the types of vulnerability disclosure, private to private. Um, this is important in particular in conversations that I've seen when uh, companies that are not necessarily familiar with vulnerability disclosure, they tend to confuse the two, and it's a very important distinction. Um, you can call it authorized vulnerability disclosure, where there is some sort of uh, legal liability protection for the researcher, or even a, even a reward, like a monetary reward or a bug bounty, and then uh, just having a fundamental capability to receive for intake. and. Uh, that is a, uh, I, the DOJ put out the uh, Vuln Disclosure Guidelines. I actually, if I have uh, I, one criticism of it, it is that it doesn't go into that latter category in great detail. In our opinion, all companies should have at least the fundamental capability to receive vulnerabilities from an external source. Uh, like that, sh that should be emphasized. Uh, Katie mentioned that the vast majority of the way of receiving uh, vulnerabilities it doesn't, just having a, a, a email address or a phone number that will get you to somebody that can actually review it and then having a process for looking at the vulnerability and getting back to the researcher, this is uh, relatively basic. I don't, I don't say it's completely simple, but it is relatively basic compared to a bug bounty. And having that fundamental, fundamental capability is becoming more important, as Frank said, more and more companies are getting into the software business. A bug bounty, on the other hand, as I'm, Katie will be able to explain uh, with uh, much greater flair than I, um, they, uh, it will potentially result, because you are sh showing that you are welcoming the research, you're providing a liability shield or giving a, a reward, you pot are potentially opening up your doors to a lot more uh, reports which may or may not be of high quality, right? And so those smaller companies, particularly the ones that have lower resources that are just getting into the software business, that may be completely inappropriate for them. But having that fundamental capability to receive, most companies still don't have that. I've, I've personally worked on disclosures with large companies where we've had to root around and try to find somebody to talk to to make a disclosure to them. And one reason why that helps researchers is if, uh, if they're going through the proper channels, like the, the, the published channels, even if there's no liability protection, there is a sign of goodwill there. 
and you tend to get a much different reaction. talking to the lawyers. It tends to result in less of uh, fewer misunderstandings and less of a freak out. Um, so th I think that that is a very important distinction when it comes to legislating. I have seen some proposals that err on this, that uh, seem to make gloss over that distinction and seem to imply that a reward is necessary or that some sort of liability protection is necessary. I think that liability protection is important in some cases. Um, we, you know, we consider it crucial in some cases, but just having the fundamental capability to receive is the most crucial. Katie, I'd like to talk about some of the efforts that are going on in Congress that, that actually touch on this, on uh, specifically DHS and I know Treasury are looking at bug bounty programs, but as, as you've spoken on very eloquently today, uh, just having a program isn't enough. You need to have capabilities and mechanisms to actually catch the bugs and to have uh, you know, real action. Can you speak on that? Right, I think that um, I think that the intent of these proposed bills is good. You know, it's it's how do we find out about more vulnerabilities is the intent. But um, for those of you who are familiar with the old GI Joe cartoons, probably not that many people in this room. Knowing is only half the battle, right? So knowing about a bug, however you acquire that information, whether it's through a volunteer who just tells you for free, or if you offer a cash reward, which is what we're talking about with bug bounties. That knowledge of a bug doesn't actually imply that you have the technical capabilities and the policy um, you know, awareness to actually do something meaningful with that bug. And those capabilities are built up over time um, quite a bit. So what we have, I think, is um, they're looking at the success of the Department of Defense's bug bounty programs, which I was an advisor coming to the Pentagon for uh, several years. Uh, before they launched that program, um, which was Hack the Pentagon. And they saw this massive success and said, perfect, We've, it's proven as a success, we shall lather, rinse, repeat via legislation. What they don't see is the massive amount of preparation to get those teams ready to receive those bug reports and handle them efficiently. And that is something that I believe, you know, the, the marketing and the alliteration and the cash dazzling everyone around bug bounties, completely missing the point that it is just an incentive to provide more bugs into that funnel of, of triage and remediation. And quite frankly, the way that bug bounties are starting to take off in private industry, they are being erroneously used as almost like virtue signaling, you know, of these companies saying, well, we take security seriously, therefore we offer these cash rewards. Now, what are they actually cleaning out of their ecosystem? The majority is still low-hanging fruit bugs, which could be found in different ways, more efficient ways. They could have actually written more secure code and incorporated a secure development life cycle to prevent the shipping of those bugs in the first place, especially if they're low-hanging fruit, easy to avoid and identify bugs. So when we look at bug bounties as a way to encourage security research, I would encourage people to think of them as incentive programs to incent from the world. When I started Microsoft's first bug bounty programs, these were not simple one bug, one bounty programs. These were things that were offering six-figure for techniques. So new exploitation techniques, something that would teach Microsoft more than just there's another bug. So I encourage people to think through um, this legislation, think through what are the technical capabilities on the back end that actually need to be in place before any vulnerability disclosure program can be successful, let alone a cash reward-based And Katie brings up a very good point. The amount of money surrounding the bug bounty industry is, um, is very high right now. Between the three largest brands in the, in the bug bounty business, Synac, HackerOne, and BugCrowd, just over the last 12 months, they've a hundred million dollars in venture capital investments to private investors. So now very much is still a critical time to get this right, right? So Oracle does not have program, not because we think they're bad. We thought that they would not be the right thing for Oracle. Uh, so as a result, we say bug bounties are not a best practice. They're a good practice in certain circumstances. And we felt they were not right for us was when we've looked at sort of uh, are the uh, vulnerability reports come from, 80% of that is internal. So we have a white hat uh, sort of internal resources. This is 80% of the bad. 
the remaining 20% most comes from customers who pay only a fairly small amount of purchase. Um, and so we felt that, therefore, our resources, our money, was better applied to, uh, to the internal resources. But that's very much uh, sort of a, a determination that a co another company in a different situation could make a different way. What, what I, another, uh, somewhere where I really, really agree with, with Katie is a bug bounty does not replace uh, an internal security program. There's very quickly sort of like, oh, it's a best practice. Well, we don't think so, but people say it's a best practice. So there you go, look at me, I have a bug bounty program. Yeah, but like, you know, you need to, as she said, you, know, you need to have this funnel. People need to take in those vulnerable reports and fix them and, you know, write patches, but also they should have white hat hackers. They should have an internal policy for writing better software, et cetera. But it's, it feels like it's oh, a surgeon is going to walk into this, the operating room and say, well, hey, if I didn't wash my hands, you know, someone should tell me. No, no. If you're not washing your hands, you're the problem. Um, in, uh, you know, some, uh, in the DOJ, and this is not a criticism of the DOJ uh, guidance that uh, was issued uh, this summer, but uh, somewhere in it, it mentions, um, you know, the uh, vulnerability disclosure policy by a company should sort of tell the researchers the things that they are not allowed to do. And one of the things that, as an example, the, the policy mentions is running password cracking tools um, to find, you know, poor password management. Well, I mean, if you need someone else to do that for you, you should not be in the software writing business because, you know, a password management tool, you can download one for free or, you know, build one uh, or buy one very cheaply. You, you should have like several running internally on every piece of software that has, you know, that, that is password enabled. Uh, that's just, that just, that just shows that you are looking at others to tie your own shoes and do your own homework. Leonard, it'd only be right if we give you a chance to respond. <laughs> <laughs> well, one, thank you. We, we, we like feedback. Um, the thing I'd flag is that the policy looks as it does because it does not presume to know who is actually going to draft a policy. So it could be um, a widget maker, it could be a software company, it could be any small or large company. Um, we do want to presume, and um, you know, within that same spirit, we intended it not to dictate the, the sort of program you're going to have, but if you're going to do this, you have to consider these potential consequences and make it clear that this is the activity that you are authorizing. Um, really, the touchstone for at least the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act is this authorization. And I think you know, what we essentially try to do with the framework is do the various wickets of decisions that people would have to make in standing up a program about how they're gonna allow people to access information and encourage them to be clear in communicating that to researchers who might be touching their network so that there later on isn't um, some sort of avoidable flare up that will grow into litigation. Um, and so, so th your point is well taken, but we actually were, were you know, drafting it with not just the software associated company in mind, but also you know, ideally the company that is smaller and saying, we still wanna take advantage of a vulnerability disclosure program to find vulnerabilities in our network. And just so that it's, it's not lost, I just wanna reiterate, so that, that the vulnerability disclosure guidance that you're talking about is for authorized uh, research, right? So it's it's offering the researcher a liability shield, and so it is in a sense welcoming the research. Um, having those kind of restrictions on just the fundamental capability to receive, uh, we would think would be inappropriate. But having it laid out for authorized research, particularly for companies that you know, fewer resources or fewer technical or less technical expertise, is more appropriate. Uh, but the guidance is flexible enough that companies can uh, adapt it to their own needs. Katie. Yep. Um, the the thing I want to point out too, we've been talking about um, you know federal level prosecutions versus civil prosecutions of private companies, and we we know um, having worked with Leonard and also actually seeing the numbers, the federal level prosecutions are very very small, whereas some of the civil liability threats that has been a major chilling effect on security researchers, where private companies are using these laws to threaten uh, and and chill security research. Um, something that is, uh, you know, that's, that's important to not to overlook here is that companies like Microsoft that had to build not just capability, but sort of a mature awareness 
of this ecosystem that it's part of. In 2007, we were the first major company back then to declare that we would not pursue legal action against a security researcher A, you know, essentially a safe harbor if they gave us a chance to fix it. Now, usually web-based vulnerabilities were faster to fix than your typical, you know, length of time to fix for other types of products that Microsoft had. So it was a low-risk way for us to signal to them that they could come forward. And you wouldn't believe what happened. The numbers of vulnerabilities in online services temporarily dropped because they were so afraid that we had said those words. They thought it was a trap. So while we were getting a trickle beforehand, they backed off because we were trying to say, no, we're explicitly welcoming you and we're saying that we're not going to pursue legal action in the civil sense. And that is the effect, you know, of, of this, this overall chilling effect as a result of these laws being used by a lot of companies to dampen security research that even when we said, we promise we won't, they backed off for a, for a short period of time. So that's something to take into consideration. One thing that I wanted to sort of come back to, uh, it's a comment that I made at the beginning, is uh, there's an important difference between research that's done on, on the software and research that, say, and security research that's done on the system. Think of it this way. It's not the same thing if you go to a hardware store, buy a lock, and then try to pick it, versus that same lock is on the door of a hotel room. You walk into that hotel room, whether you're a customer or not, and you try to pick that lock. See, because, I mean, if you pick the lock and you walk in, you might walk in on someone who's just stepping out of their shower, right? So there's, there's, um, it's not the same thing, even though technically it looks like uh, the same thing. Uh, so for Oracle, while, you know, we welcome reports of vulnerabilities on software uh, that a researcher may be running on his own machine, we have, we're much more concerned about uh, security research that targets our systems, because our systems are cloud systems. In there, you don't find just Oracle stuff. Our business is to host um, the data of our customers. So, you know, pick your, I don't know, your, your large, you know, Fortune 500 company. We run their HR system. So we have not just corporate data from that customer, but like, you know, the data about their employees, social security numbers, you know, pay, et cetera. So, so if that system, is being hacked, even by someone with the best of intentions, you know, and they find a, a flaw, then they get to the data, and then they're, you know, exposing to, to themselves and maybe to others, the, you know, the very confidential data, not just of Oracle, but of, of you know, innocent bystanders, of those customers. So we tend to have a, a, a much more reluctant uh, uh, view of that kind of research. And with that, I would like to conclude our conversation today. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Harley, you got it. <laughs> <laughs> Just this. So the the problem that uh, Frank outlines is is real. I think that the line is appropriate, right? So computers and software that you yourself own a copy of, and those that are owned by somebody else. Um, but for when it comes to legislating, that's an, actually an extremely difficult area to to work on, uh, because on the internet, the mess, the the line between what is publicly available and what's not is actually not very clear, and it's very, very difficult to nail down in legislation. I'm also not entirely certain that uh, working on that particular problem, which in my opinion has actually sucked a tremendous amount of attention uh, uh, from academics and, and advocates when it comes to CFA and researcher protection, I'm not sure that solving that particular problem will make a tremendous difference in the lives of researchers uh, who, by and large, So I would the, look at the truth we're trying to get into the quagmire that has been now discussed for something like 10 years about what's public and what's not on the open internet. So it seems like we have uh, a little more time for some questions from the audience. Yes, sir. Okay. Um, so my question is about the distinction between what we might call irresponsible uh, uh, disclosure and criminal disclosure. So I get somebody as a lawyer comes to me and says, I've been hacking X and such bank and I've discovered all these vulnerabilities. I want to, I want to get paid for the work I've done. I want $100,000. And I want you to go to this bank and say, give me $100,000, I'll tell you what the problems are. 
If you don't tell me, I'm going to make them public. All right? Um, to me, that's a dark gray hat hacker. But on the other hand, they're trying to be somewhat responsible. They are not committing a crime. Let's assume that they did not penetrate the system in order to, to find the vulnerabilities. And yet, they're likely to get what Katie already described as the C 